Hello viewers, welcome to this class on mathematical finance. Uh, today we will continue our lecture on properties of derivatives. Remember that in the last lecture we had talked about uh, uh, forwards and we had derived using the no arbitrage principle as to what the appropriate forward price should be. Uh, in today's class we will look at uh, the analogous derivative of forwards namely futures and then we will also discuss a little bit about uh, options and one important property of option namely the put call parity. All right, so we start off with uh, futures. Now remember that uh, just like a forward contract, a futures contract involves the delivery of an underlying asset at a specified future time and price. That means both the time and the price have to be specified. So, but how are they different from uh, a futures contract? So, in case of a forward or futures contract, one of the two parties will lose money and consequently there is always a risk of default by the party that suffers the loss. And it is for this reason that we accordingly futures contracts are designed to eliminate such risk. So, let me illustrate this a little more in a descriptive way. Uh, suppose that there is a party A and a party B and party A and B both agree on a forward slash futures contract that they are going to buy or sell the underlying asset for a fixed price at a future time. Now what might happen is that once the price is agreed upon and it is observed that after some time the price of the asset is slowly going down. So, in that case there is always the possibility that the party which had agreed to buy the underlying asset in the agreement is likely to default because he or she instead of honoring this contract and paying the forward price or the futures price may instead decide to buy it at a lower price in the market if the downward trend of the price continues. In an analogous manner, suppose that the price of the underlying asset is slowly going up, then the party with the short position in the forward of the futures contract, that is the party which had agreed to sell the underlying asset, they might view this as an opportunity that they could default because if they default, then they can sell the underlying asset in the market for a higher price which is what is expected if the trend of the higher prices continue thereby defaulting. So, that means that depending on the direction of movement of the prices of the underlying asset, one party or the other 
in the forward or the futures agreement is likely to default. Now, this risk of default certainly is more pronounced in case of a forward contract since those are over the counter contracts. However, the futures contract which are uh, traded on exchanges have a mechanism to prevent such uh, defaults taking place or more specifically they have a mechanism by which the party if a party defaults then the other party they are compensated from the losses that they would incur by as a result of the default by one of the other parties. And this is why forwards and futures if you compare at them the advantage of a forward is that you can set your own contract, but the risk is that there might always be a default. On the other hand uh, futures have much more restricted terms and conditions, but at the same time it offers the advantage that the presence of the clearing house or the exchange ensures that in the event of a default the other party is actually compensated for the losses that they might incur. Okay, now, we assume that time is discrete with steps of length tau and typically this tau is going to be a day. Now, let S n where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, so on be the stock prices and f and t be the corresponding futures prices such that n of tau is less than or equal to capital T and here of course, n is equal to 0, 1, 2, etcetera. So, by this I mean here the following that uh, if we have this time point n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2 and so on, then S n is going to the price of the stock and consequently small f and t will be used to denote the futures price for a maturity of capital T, but decided at the time point n when the price of the underlying asset or the stock is s of n. All right. So, now uh, accordingly it is obvious that uh, only f 0 t is known initially, which means that all the other futures prices as f and t for n equal to 1, 2, so on are random variables. That means, sitting at time t equal to 0, you know what is going to be the futures price for expiration capital T, but you cannot predict exactly what the futures price are going to be at all subsequent time points or what exactly is going to be the evolution of the agreed upon futures price after the initial time point t is equal to 0 and which is why f of n comma t is considered to be a random variable. Now, at uh, time t is equal to 0, there is no cash flow, but there are cash flows during the remainder of lifetime of the futures contract. Now, contrast this. So, in contrast, 
a forward contract remember forward contract was over the counter a forward contract where you contrast this with the forward contract where there is a single cash flow at expiration so now this is one of the fundamental differences between forward and futures contract and we have said that there are cash flows during the remainder of the lifetime of the futures contract so this means now these cash flows are essentially designed in a way so that they exactly compensate for any losses by a party in case of the default by other party so accordingly uh, the futures contract uh, involves uh, these random cash flows that are known as and the term is marking to market or sometimes is denoted as M to M. Okay. So, normally uh, now typically how does this marking to market happens? So, normally at uh, each n equal to 1, 2, so on uh, that means on a daily basis the holder of the long position that means the party which has agreed to purchase the underlying asset will receive or pay an amount f of n t minus f of n minus 1 t if f n t minus f n minus 1 t is positive or negative uh, respectively. And this is since this is the long position, so accordingly the short position the reverse payment is applicable. Uh, so, this means that if this quantity is positive f of n t minus f n minus 1 t then f then the party with the long position will receive f of n t minus f n minus 1 t and they will receive this from the party with the short position and vice versa. So, one little note is that the futures price for immediate execution is just nothing but the price of the underlying asset or the spot price of the underlying asset at that particular time capital T because it is so the, this is basically in accordance with the no arbitrage principle that if you are agreeing to undertake the transaction to a futures contract and if it is happening immediately then obviously in order to avoid a price mismatch you need them both to be identical. Okay, so now let us look at the practical uh, regulations. I mean, how do futures actually uh, work in uh, real terms? So, in, in a from practical point of view, uh, when a futures contract is actually uh, executed over an, in an exchange or through a clearing house, then each investor of the futures contract that means any investor who gets into a futures contract they have to a deposit pay a deposit called uh, initial margin with the exchange 
or the clearing house. Now, for long position, uh, as already noted, an amount of f and t minus f of n minus 1 comma t is added or subtracted if it is positive or negative respectively. So, for short position exactly the opposite happens. Now, here I want to make a few observation. Uh, the first observation is any amount in excess of the initial margin. So, the initial margin is like initial security deposit can be withdrawn by the investor from their margin account. Uh, and the second observation is that but if it falls below a certain level and we will call this since this is a maintenance account or a margin account this is what is called the maintenance margin. That means, it is the minimum amount of security deposit that has to be uh, put up with the clearing house, then the clearing house will issue a request for more top up deposit and this process is known as a margin call. That means, it is a call uh, to actually replenish your margin account. So, let us illustrate this through a little example as follows. Suppose that the initial margin or the initial deposit in the margin account is set at 10 percent and maintenance margin is set at 5 percent and this percentage says R of the futures price prevailing at that time. Now, we will look at a table uh, to illustrate certain uh, scenarios of futures prices. All right, so, we will have this small column. So, this column is n that means, I will take n to be equal to 0 that means, the 0th day 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. Now, suppose the futures prices on those days are 140. 138, 130, 140, 150. Uh, that means, these are the futures prices that are actually agreed upon uh, on that particular day. That means, on the initial day, the agreed upon price to be paid in future is 140, the next day is 138, then the day after is 130, then on the, on the, at the third day is 140 and the last case is 150. So, let us look at what are the things that we need to take into consideration. So, we will have the cash flow, margin 1, we will have the payment and margin 2. 
So, margin 1 basically is the deposit as, as the beginning of the day and margin 2 is basically end of day. And payment you know this is the amount received or paid. So, let us start off with n equal to 0 when f the price of the futures is 140. So, the cash flow is that this is the opening and the initial margin is 0. Now, we open the margin account remember that you have to put up 10 percent of the futures price for the margin account. So, 10 percent of 140 is 14. Now, since you make a payment of 14, so this is going to be minus 14 which you have paid to the clearing house and that means that your balance in the margin account at the end of the day is going to be plus 14. Now, suppose next day the futures price for the same expiration and for the same underlying asset it falls to 138. Then what has to be the cash flow? Remember the cash flow was nothing but f of n t minus f of n minus 1 t. So, in this case this is going to be 138 minus 140 this is minus 2. Now, the previous day the margin had an amount of 14 uh, and remember that we are talking this from the point of view of the party with the long position. So, since the previous day the margin was 14 and the cash flow has to be minus 2 that means, this is the amount of money that will go to the party with the short position to their margin account. That means, your remaining balance is going to be 14 minus 2 which is going to be 12. Now, uh, since the 10 percent of 13.8 uh, is 13.8, but remember that we had given the condition that the maintenance margin is set at 5 percent. So, since an amount of 12 that is there in the margin account is still more than 5 percent of 138. So, no payment is actually required to be made to the clearing house and so your balance at the end of this day 1 is going to be 12. Now, suppose that the day after that the price of the futures goes to 130. That means, the payment that the party with the long position has to make to the short position that means, the amount that will be transferred from the margin account of the party with the long position to that of the short position. This is going to be 130 minus 138 which is minus 8. Now, if this minus 8 is taken out of the remaining balance of 12 that means, the margin account will then just have an amount of 4. Now, this is going to be a problem because this amount of 4 is less than 5 percent of 130 which is 6.5. So, that means that in view of this margin being followed or the amount in the margin account falling below 5 percent, the party will be getting a call from the clearing house asking them to bring the balance up to 10 percent of the uh, of the prevailing price. So, accordingly this means that 4 is there in the margin account but 10 percent of 130 is 13. So, in order to increase 4 to 13 an additional payment of 9 has to be made. So, an amount of minus 9 goes out of the party with the long position resulting in the balance in the margin account held to the clearing house being equal to 13. Now, suppose that the day after uh, the, the futures price goes to 140. So, the cash flow, so for the first time they part of the long position will gain an amount of 140 minus 130 which is equal to 10. Now, the previous day the balance was 13 and they have received an amount of 10 in their margin account from the margin account of the party with the short position. So, that means the new balance becomes 13 plus 10 which is 23. Now, the party with the long position is only required to maintain the balance at 10 percent of the futures price which in this case is 14, but they actually have a higher amount 23. So, the excess amount of 23 minus 14 they can take out. So, they will receive an amount of 
23 minus 14 which is plus 9 and as a result the balance comes down to 14. Now finally suppose that the price of the, the or the value of the futures uh, or the agreed upon price goes to 150 then the cash flow for the long party is going to be 150 minus 140 which is equal to 10. Now the previous this balance was 14 and with the current balance of 10 the balance in the margin account becomes 24 that means you had 14 the previous day and they will receive 10 from the margin account of the other party and so you have a balance of 24 but you are only required to maintain a balance of 10 percent of 150 which is 15. So that means out of 24 you can take out an amount of 9 and the remaining balance is going to be equal to 15 and this goes on until the final execution of the contract. So you see let us see it from the point of view of the party with the long position. So they started off with the agreed upon price of 140. The next day the price goes to 138 which means that from the point of view of the party which is going to buy the asset they see that well it is showing a downward trend. So that means that there is a likelihood that they might default and so that means that is a result they have to pay an amount of minus 2. Then when it goes down further to 130 there is now even a greater incentive for the party with the long position to actually default and so that means they have to make another additional contribution because they are a greater you know likelihood of actually defaulting so accordingly they pay an amount of 8. However, they the subsequently the futures price goes up to 140 so the trend which was earlier downward is upwards and so this means that the party which will sell the underlying asset they are likely to default if this upward trend continues and that is why they have to pay this party with the long position an amount of 10 and again when it further increases this means the party with the long position is seeing that there is an upward trend and that means if the contract is executed and the trend continues they will be able to actually get it for a lower price of 140 that was agreed at time t equal to 0 despite the upward movement of the price. So this means that the party with the short position or even has a now a higher chance of defaulting and that is the reason why from their margin account an amount of 10 is taken out and put into the margin account of the party with the long position and this trend continues until the final execution of the contract and if there is an at any point both the parties they can actually move out of the particular position if they want with the respective remaining balance in the margin account. All right, so we conclude our discussion with uh, on forwards and futures uh, with a, just a simple theorem and the theorem says that if the interest rate R is constant then you can show that the futures price f of 0 t is going to be the same as the forward price f of 0 capital T. So we now come to the second topic that is some general properties of options. So for this uh, let us just begin by recalling the following. You would recall that uh, an European call option gives the holder the right to buy the underlying asset for a fixed price x uh, which is known as the exercise price or sometimes the strike price 
at a specified future time called the exercise time or expiry time capital T. Now, the same in an analogous way we would recall that uh, we had the definition for a European put option and in case of European put option the holder has the right to sell for the exercise price x at expiration capital T. Now, likewise an American call or a put option will give the holder the right to buy or sell the underlying asset for strike x, but on or before expiration capital so, now let us recall what were the payoffs. So, the payoff for a European call was maximum of S of t minus x comma 0 or sometimes this is denoted as S of t minus x plus and the payoff in case of a European put option is maximum of x minus s t comma 0 or x minus s t plus. Now, what you are going to do is we will try to establish some uh, properties, general properties pertaining to options, uh, a lot of which will be dealt with uh, in terms of the price of the option. Just to recap what we had talked about earlier about the price of the option is that unlike forwards and futures contracts, uh, options are legally binding on only one party. So, this means that it is a situation where uh, only the holder of the option has a position of leverage or advantage putting the writer of the option at a disadvantage and in order to accept this slightly weakened position. Uh, the writer of the option will expect a certain upfront payment at time t equal to 0 from the holder of the option or the buyer of the option. And this particular initial payment or compensation is what is known as the price of the option. So, accordingly uh, our aim here is to establish some general properties and bounds for option prices for which there are certain assumptions that are made. So, accordingly we will make the following assumptions. First assumption, uh, first assumption is that options are freely traded that means they are completely liquid. Uh, secondly, we will use C E and uh, P E as price of European call or put option. Thirdly, we will use the notation C A P A to denote price of American call or put option. So, C will be used to denote call options, P will be used to denote put options 
and E will be used for European option and A for American option. And remember these are the prices that means the uh, premium that uh, the buyer of the option pays to the holder of the option. Number 4 uh, is that we will assume the same interest rate for both lending and borrowing. So, typically the, the, there is a difference between these two, but for the purpose of this discussion we will assume that you can borrow or lend uh, at the same interest rate and uh, for the purpose of uh, calculating interest we will make use of continuous compounding. All right. Uh, so, uh, it, once we have this uh, notation set up, what you can say is that what is going to be the gain? So, I will just make a remark about the gains of a buyer. So, in case of a European call, the gain will be whatever is the payoff ST minus X plus minus the premium they have paid at the initial time t equal to 0 whose future value will be given by a C e multiplied by e raised to r t. So, this means that at the initial time t equal to 0 they pay an amount of C e which had they not paid but had invested in their uh, money market account or a bank account would have grown to be an amount of C e raised to e raised to R t. So, this is the amount that actually that goes out of their pocket, but then they stand to gain an amount of whatever is the payoff S t minus x plus minus this quantity C e e raised to R t. Similarly, in case of a European put as you can guess analogously this is going to be x minus S t plus minus the price of the European put into e raised to r t. So, that means that the potential losses for the buyer is restricted just to the price C e or P e of the option. All right. So, then we now prove a very important result uh, which is known as the put call parity and this will be revisited later in the course also. So, as the name suggests put call parity is nothing but a relationship between the put and the call option. Uh, or rather the price of them and the put call parity states the following. For a stock that pays no dividends, the following relation holds between the prices of European call and European put options with the same that means both have the same exercise or strike price. x and exercise time t and the relation is C e minus P e is equal to S 0 minus x e raised to minus r t. So, the proof goes as follows again we will make use of the no arbitrage principle. So, suppose we assume that this equality does not hold. So, we export the two possibilities that is case 1. Suppose that 
C e minus P e is greater than S 0 minus X e raised to minus R t, then what strategy should we adopt? Then at t is equal to 0, what we will do is that we will buy a share for S 0, we will buy a put option for what price? For P e. Thirdly, we will sell a call option for price C e and what is the remaining balance? So, the remaining balance is going to be see you have bought a share for S 0 that means you have spent an amount of S 0. So, you have minus S 0. You have bought a put option for P e. So, you have spent an amount of P e. So, you have minus P e and you have sold a call option for C e. So, this is going to be plus C e and this amount will invest this at rate R or borrow at rate R if this quantity is negative. See that is the reason why we had to assume that uh, the lending and borrowing uh, or, or investment and borrowing both actually uh, can take place at the rate R. So, what is your net here? So, accordingly your net you know whatever money was there you have invested the balance or borrowed. So, the net is going to be equal to 0. Now, let us see what happens to this position at time t is equal to capital T. Now, at t equal to capital T let us close the positions one by one. First of all we had made this investment at the rate r. So, that means we will receive C e minus P e minus S 0 into e raise to R t or uh, pay if the original amount was negative here. So, this position is closed. Now, <coughs> remember we had bought a share for S 0. So, we will sell the share. Now, for what price do we sell the share? We will sell the share for x. Now, how are you going to guarantee that we are going to receive this amount of x? So, we are going to sell the share for x in two ways. Firstly, either in case if s of t is less than x, then what is going to happen? Remember that you had bought a put option for P, that means you have the right to sell, which means that if the prevailing stock price S of capital T is less than X at time capital T, then you can exercise your right under the put option and receive an amount of X. So, that means if S T is less than X, then you exercise put option. However, if S of t is greater than or equal to x, this means that the party with the call option, remember you have sold a call option that means you are under obligation to sell. So, if S of t is greater than or equal to x, that means definitely the other party is going to exercise the option and so that means you have to sell it the or rather you are obliged to sell it for an amount of x. So, this means that if S t is greater than or equal to x, the put uh, rather the call option will be exercised. So, in either case you will at least get the amount of x. Now, so this means that this position has been code closed or this position has been closed. So, this means the following. So, once you have done all this transaction, what will you get? So, you will the net amount is going to be equal to what? You have sold the share uh, for x 
and you have received this amount. So, the net amount is that the, you have received C e minus P e minus S 0 into e raised to R t plus you have received an amount of x by selling the share. So, then this can be rewritten as C e minus P e minus S 0 plus x e raised to minus R t whole thing into e raised to R t. So, we can factor out the e raised to R t and remember what is this expression? This expression is exactly this minus this C e minus P e minus S 0 plus x e raised to R t. C e minus P e minus S 0 plus x e raised to R t. This is a positive quantity this obviously is a positive quantity. So, this is going to be greater than 0. So, this means that an initial investment of 0 results in a net positive profit and so this means that there is an arbitrage opportunity which shows that this possibility has to be ruled out. All right. <clears throat> now, let us look at the second case. Now, we suppose that C e minus P e is less than S 0 minus X e raised to minus R t. Then what are you going to do at time t equal to 0? At t equal to 0, we will do the following. We will short sell one share and receive an amount of the current spot price which is S 0, write a put option for P e that means, uh, sell a put option, then buy a call option for C e. So, when you short sell one share, you have received S 0. When you sell the put option, you have received uh, P e and when you buy the call option, you have spent an amount of C. So, then with this balance, you invest this entire amount at rate R or in case this term is negative, this expression is negative then you need to borrow. <clears throat> now, let us see what happens at time t equal to capital T. At t equal to capital T, you will basically receive your investment uh, amount along with the interest. So, you will receive S 0 minus C e plus P e into e raised to R t or uh, basically repay uh, if it was negative. Now, you buy a share for x. Why do you need to buy a share for x? Because remember you had short sold one share. So, you will need to procure a share from the market in order to return this particular share to the owner. Uh, of the share and so you have to buy a share. Now, you can always buy a share for an amount f x and how can you do that? You can do that in the following way that if your s of t is greater than x, then you are the owner of a call option. So, that means you can exercise the call and if s of t is less than or equal to x, then you know that since you have written a put option. So, that means the party which had bought the put option for you will obviously going to exercise that option because they can sell it to you for a higher price of x as compared to the prevailing market spot price of s of t. So, in this case the other party they will the put option will be exercised. 
So, irrespective of whether S of t is greater than uh, uh, x equal to or less than x, you can actually sell the share for an amount of x only in one case you, it will because it will happen because you are exercising your call option and in the other case the party which is the owner of the put option that you had sold that party will exercise the put option. So, that means they have bought you have bought the so that means that this position is closed this is closed this is closed and once you have the share you then return the share to the owner closing the short position. So, then what is going to be your net? Your net is you have received an amount of uh, S0 minus CE plus PE into E raise to RT and you have bought a share for X that means you have spent an amount of X and how can you write this? This can be written as uh, S0 minus CE plus PE minus XE raise to minus RT into E raise to RT. And remember from here you will get S0 minus CE plus PE minus XE raise to minus RT this is positive. So, that means that this quantity is going to be positive, this is anywhere positive, so the entire thing is positive. So, that means the net investment of 0 at time t equal to 0 results in a positive profit which means that there is an arbitrage. So, the other possibility here also does not hold. So, the, once we have excluded both the inequalities, this means that we have the only other possibility is that they are equal that is C e minus P e is equal to S 0 minus X e raise to minus R of T. Okay, so, we conclude today's class uh, with a couple of observations uh, or rather extension of the put call parity. So, the first observation is if div 0 please be careful with the notation div 0 is the present value of a dividend paid by the stock between times 0 and capital T then C e minus P e is going to be equal to S 0 minus div 0 minus X e raise to minus R t. So, please be careful if, if a dividend div is paid then div 0 is going to be the present value of the dividend at time t equal to 0 then for this particular underlying asset the put call parity gets modified to this relation to include the dividend. Likewise, the second observation is that if dividends are paid continuously at a rate R div, then C e minus P e is equal to S 0 e raise to minus R div into T minus X e raise to minus R T. This brings us to the conclusion of uh, the put call parity. Uh, in the next class what we will do is that we will look at uh, what is a put call parity estimate right. and this will hold in case of uh, American options and uh, this will be given uh, in terms of a relation like 
S0 minus x c raise to minus r t greater than or equal to C A minus P A greater than or equal to S0 minus x. Since the American options uh, do not have uh, a pre-specified time point at which uh, they can be exercised, uh, by which I mean that even though the capital T is specified, the expiration uh, capital T is specified, but the actual exercise of the option can be done by the owner of the option at any time on or before capital T. That means that the chances of equality holding like the put call parity uh, does not exist and instead we will basically have estimates or bounds for the put call parity. So, to just to summarize what we did today, we have essentially looked at two things. One is that we extended the followers contracts in case of a futures contract uh, through an illustrative example of what is known as the marking to market and how margin accounts actually function uh, in a real life setting. And, uh, uh, and we also made the observation that under a specific circumstance, uh, how the futures price that is agreed upon is equal to the uh, price of a forward contract. Uh, we also talked a little bit about uh, the price of the option and then how it can be used to actually specify the gains from the point of view of the buyer of the option, where whereas uh, the gain is going to be uh, the payoff that you that they can be expected uh, minus uh, whatever premium uh, or the price of the option that is paid by the holder of the option. And finally, uh, we looked at an important result connecting the price of the European call and the European put option, namely the put call parity. Thank you for watching.